We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. God, let us be a generation seeks, who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. Our New Testament reading is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 7 through 9. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we gather here to worship you, to honor you, to give you praise. And so I ask, Lord Christ, that where we need to be convicted, where we need to be changed, that you would move within us. Through the Holy Spirit, you would guide us and direct us so that our steps would be those that were in accord with you and that the love that we show to one another would be honoring to you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
Before I lift my cares, I will lift my arms. I want to know you, I want to find you in every season and every moment. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart and see. of pain, let me feel your joy. I want to know you, I want to find you in every season, in every moment. Before I speak a word, I will bring my heart and see. Join your hearts with me now in prayer. Lord, we do pray that we would seek you first. And we know that for that to happen, uh, we need you to do a work in us. And so Holy Spirit, come. Transform us, renew us, we pray. Lord, there are those in our fellowship that we especially want to remember right now. Madonna um, Woy and her surgery Monday morning um, as she awaits triple bypass. I pray for the surgeons. I pray for those who will tend to her. And I pray for your hand of deliverance upon her. For Charlotte Gunter and her surgery for total hip replacement, I pray that that will go well and that she will recover quickly. For others in our fellowship who are sick, we pray for healing. For our land, we pray for healing. You are a miracle worker, Lord. And we pray that you would bring about a miracle, that you would grant healing from COVID-19, that you would grant healing from the unrest that continues to rage through our streets for the lack of unity that persists. Bring unity, we pray. Bring a spirit of love into the hearts of 
every citizen. Bring, I pray, conversion and repentance and yielded hearts to you where that is needed. We pray this, Lord Christ, for your glory and for it to go forth in power and majesty. Indeed, we pray as thy kingdom is in heaven, the kingdom would be on earth. And so come quickly even, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Eric Little was called the Flying Scotsman because of his talent as a sprinter. In 1924, he was heavily favored to win the 100-meter sprint in the Summer Olympics. But a problem emerged. The race was scheduled to take place on the Sabbath. Little, a devout follower of Christ, refused to run. And against mounting pressure of government officials to compete for the love of country, Little opted instead to take a stand for his love for God. His decision made headlines in newspapers worldwide. Surprisingly, Little, who was not known for longer races, managed to qualify for the 400-meter race. It did not take place on the Sabbath. Prior to the event, Little found a note that the team trainer left him. He who honors him, God will honor. Little shocked everyone when he won the gold medal in the 400 meter race. Eric Little did not dedicate his heart to worldly achievement or acceptance, but to honoring Jesus Christ. In fact, he once told his fiancée that the only reason he ran was because in doing so, he felt God's pleasure. That is a lesson that Proverbs stresses over and over, the importance of dedicating our hearts to honoring God. In this way, Scripture should impact what we think on, what we talk about, and what we do hour to hour. Consider with me today Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. This is the word of God. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. In only eight verses, Solomon makes connections to our ears, to our lips, to our eyes, our feet, and our heart. We should be careful what we listen to because what we hear will impact our thoughts and our speech. We need to control what we look at because our gaze will impact that which we pursue. Above all, we must guard our heart from which everything we do flows. At the root of unwise behavior is our idolatry. The sin of idolatry exalts something to a position that only God should hold. Whatever we fix our hearts upon, ultimately it will consume us. Timothy Keller says, the human heart is an idol factory that takes good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. Our hearts deify them as the center of our lives because we think they can give us significance and security, safety and fulfillment if we but attain them. I contend that a desire for acceptance resides at the root of our idolatry and that we frequently seek such acceptance through our accomplishments. Perhaps a young person believes that he or she can gain wider acceptance through something like academics or athletics. 
In this way, students might exalt their GPA or their scoring average. As adults, perhaps we believe we will find acceptance through our bodily physique, our, our worldly position. In this way, we exalt our appearance, our, our achievements. We believe if we excel in these areas or in some other way, we will secure the love, the affirmation that we desire, the ticket to the so-called good life. Only Solomon writes in Proverbs 11, verse 7, when a wicked man dies, his hope perishes. All he expected from his power comes to nothing. When the world is our oyster, we lose sight of that which is eternally significant. We spend so much time, so much energy chasing after acceptance through fading accomplishments that we take our eyes off the only one who provides a hope which never fades. But if not seeking acceptance through achievement, some of us may try to find acceptance through association. In essence, we seek for other people to give us the love that we so eagerly desire. If only I got married, everything would be better. If only I had children, my marriage would experience greater fulfillment. If only I were friends with so-and-so, things would be easier. I would be happier. Only as Keller stated, the flaw to this focus of our hearts is in deifying the wrong things. A familiar quote from Blaise Pascal reads, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. While our idolatry is at the root of unwise behavior, our indecency is the expression of it. Solomon's counsel reminds me of a chorus from an old country song by Kenny Rogers called The Gambler. You've got to know when to fold or hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. On the surface, the song is about playing cards, but I think it's really about life. We have to realize when it's time to hold on to something important and when it's important to run from something that would bring us harm. Proverbs tells us to run from drunkenness. Proverbs 23, 29 to 35 describes an alcoholic as one of woe, strife, and bloodshot eyes. Alcoholics will likely drink without considering any consequences. Some behaviors of a heavy drinker include irresponsibility, fighting, saying hurtful things, taking unnecessary risks like drinking and driving. Alcoholics are prone to ask, when shall I awake that I may seek another drink? But they will consistently deny that they even have a problem. Proverbs also tells us to run from gluttony. Proverbs 23, verse 21, includes the glutton with the drunkard as among those who will come to ruin. Behind excessive eating often resides a deep desire for acceptance. Food merely becomes a substitute. When you feel lonely or depressed or unsuccessful or stressed, you turn to food. Additionally, the problem of gluttony can extend beyond overeating. The Apostle Paul indicates that gluttony actually involves overindulgence in general. Your God is your belly, your glory is in your shame, and you set your mind on earthly things. I once heard a Trappist monk say, Americans live more for the thingdom come than they do for thy kingdom come. It is gluttonous to fill our lives with excess clothes, iPods, and so on. When we look to earthly things to fill a void, when we rush out to buy the newest and supposedly best thing, when our closet is overflowing with items that we've only worn, wore once, 
We struggle with overindulgence and we need to develop the discipline of self-control. Materialism easily becomes an idol in American culture. Proverbs also tells us to run from sexual immorality. He deals with that in detail um, in chapters 5 through 7. The summative advice of Solomon is to avoid temptation by not putting ourselves in situations or places that prove especially explosive. Location, location, location is not just a real estate slogan. If we fail to avoid temptation, we can easily give way to lust and make poor choices. Solomon especially wants us to guard our heart, and that involves what we look at. We will not fix our gaze upon lewd images in magazines or through websites. Instead, we will commit ourselves to the words of David from Psalm 101, verse 3. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Whether it is drunkenness, drugs, gluttony, sex, lewdness, or so on, the central problem regarding sinful conduct stems from the absence of God as holding preeminence in our lives, a.k.a. idolatry. Hasidic Rabbi Shai Tob teaches and writes about the issue of addiction and the spiritual element necessary for recovery. According to Tob, the substance or the idol is not the addict's problem. It is the addict's best attempt at a solution. But the only true solution, he suggests, is a spiritual breakthrough that supplies the deep-seated need for union with God. The issue surrounding unwise behavior is thus not, is, is not just knowledge-based. It is a spiritual matter. The spiritual breakthrough that all our hearts need involves a reshaping of our identity. 1 John 5, verses 20 and 21 read, And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. So it is that we must replace our idols through Christ as our intercessor. It's why Hebrews 7.25 teaches that Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Wise behavior is not looking to our own achievements for worldly acceptance, but it is depending upon Christ's achievement for God's acceptance. Wise behavior is not associating with others for worldly acceptance, but it is associating with Christ for God's acceptance. Once we dedicate our hearts to Jesus, we shift from indecency to uprightness, and we begin to experience restoration unto right conduct. We use uplifting, edifying words. We meditate on that which is noble, praiseworthy, and true. We set our feet toward carrying the gospel to others. I like to call it, I like to call it becoming Nike Christians. Just live it. Devereaux Jarrett urges us to let others follow their own inclinations and seek the gratification of their lusts and appetites. But as for you, your inquiry will be, what shall we do to please the Lord and promote his glory in the world? The challenge then is to find our identity in right conduct that honors the Lord. And we achieve that only through a closer walk with Jesus. I love my wife. It makes sense that I want to spend time with her, that I want to talk with her. It makes sense that I want to study her in order to know the things that she delights in. That same principle should apply to our walk 
with the Lord. If we love him, we will want to converse with Christ through prayer and we will enter into his presence through worship. If we love him, we will want to study and meditate upon the Bible so that we do not sin against God. And yet we understand that actual religion lies not in prayer, not in reading our Bible, not in church attendance, but in the quality of life that those things create in us. A chief characteristic that these observances should create in us is a love for one another. Paul states in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, which we read earlier, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Proverbs 3, 27 and 28 instructs us not to withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in our power to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I will give when you have it with you. That's something about Winstanley Baptist Church that I love so much. The generous and giving heart of our people. And so what might this look like in our day-to-day -day lives? In the church, at home, with work, as a citizen? John Wesley said it like this. Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And Gary Babcock concludes, what ought I to do really leads to another question. What kind of person ought I to be? I ought to be a person for whom love, service, and obedience to God are the major priorities. In East of Eden, John Steinbeck writes, a man, after he has brushed off the dust and chips of his life, will have left only the hard, clean questions. Was it good or was it evil? Have I done well or ill? Herodotus in the Persian War tells a story of how Croatius, the richest and most favored king of his time, asked Solon the Athenian a leading question. He would not have asked it if he had not been worried about the answer. Who, he asked, is the luckiest person in the world? He must have been eaten with doubt and hungry for reassurance. Solon told him of three lucky people in old times, and Croesus more than likely did not listen, so anxious he was about himself. And when Solon did not mention him, Croesus was forced to say, do you not consider me lucky? Solon did not hesitate in his answer. How can I tell, he said, you aren't dead yet. And in our time, when a man dies, if he has had wealth and influence and power and all the vestments that arouse envy, and after the living takes stock of the dead man's property and his eminence and works and monuments, the question is still there. Was his life good or was it evil? So I return now to Eric Little. For I think he forces us to ask what we do and why we do it. Little did not run for himself. He ran for God. In doing that, he experienced greater fulfillment than those who just ran for an earthly medal, which would tarnish and that people would soon forget. Let me ask you, do you know who won the 1924 100 meters in the Summer Olympics? I don't. But I know who Eric Little was. Who or what are you running after? Do you run to experience God's pleasure or do you run for your own? 
If you say you have been running toward the wrong things and not from them, it is never too late to know what to do. Give your heart all that you are to Christ and become renewed as the person who the Holy Spirit calls you to be. Do not dwell on your past, but do not linger in patterns of indecency either. Jesus stands ready to intercede on your behalf before the Heavenly Father. When it comes your time to die, I would alter the question that John Steinbeck asked. Did your heart belong to Jesus? Or did it belong to idols? I pray that you will say, Lord Jesus, change my heart. Make me ever true. I pray that we would walk closer with Christ. I am weak, but thou art strong. from all wrong I'll be satisfied as long as I walk dear Lord close to thee just a closer walk with thee granted Jesus is my Just a closer walk